All right, so uh, follow up from lecture from this morning, but let's pretend the last lecture was Wednesday and this is Friday. You have two days to forget what I talked about. All right, so now uh, we're going to continue on, though, with this idea and introduce the concept of what are called wavelets. OK, so that's going to be the basic thrust of today is to understand these objects. How to use them. We're already talking about time, frequency. Uh, and what we want to talk about is, again, this concept of when I take a signal, I want frequency information. I want time information. I want it all. Right? Fourier transform doesn't give it all to me. Time series doesn't give it all to me. Gabor doesn't give it all to me. But wavelets, they're getting closer. Okay? So that's what we're going to go after and try to figure out how it does that. OK, so here's the problem. I have some signal and time that I measure. There it is, beautiful signal and time. OK? And I want to understand both frequency content of that signal. I want to understand uh, the time content. I want to know when the frequencies actually occur, right? I mean, if you look at this signal, look here, during this little interval, there's some high frequency stuff. But here, there might be some low frequency stuff. Right? So you're going to ultimately, what we learned is say, uh, the one idea that Gabor had is to say, if I want to try to localize in time and space, is I could potentially then put like a filter on this thing. Something like this. And it has some width A. And what I do, I slide this filter back and forth. Not back and forth. I just I slide it <laughs> once. I don't have to do it back and forth. So start here, filter portion, move it, move it, move it, move it computationally. So theoretically, I continuously move it all across all of time. But computationally, right, I would take discrete jumps, you know, move it delta t to the future, delta t to the future. And I would actually say, what is the frequency content in every single little window of time that I've got, OK? What is the problem with doing this? It's a nice concept, right? But the fact is, this window, what are the longest wavelengths that it can handle? It's determined by that window size, right? I mean, if you're going to do a Fourier mode expansion in here, ultimately, which is what we're still doing, we're still using Fourier modes to represent the spectrum, then whatever fits in here, that's your box size. Kind of, that's like your longest wavelength piece that you have in there. So what if the signal? I mean, I've drawn it here. What if there's a signal that has some really low frequency components in it? You just threw them all away with this Gabor window. So you, you do a very poor job in getting, let's say, um, frequency resolution. You retain a lot of frequencies, OK? But the cost of throwing that away is that now you actually have the frequency content of this in a specific time. So you've, you've You've traded throwing some of this away for now I have some time information, right? So this is what you're trying to do. I get time, I get time information, I get frequency information both. But I've thrown something away. Okay? But the window size that you pick is actually the problem. Because the window size you pick is actually determining if you're throwing away a lot of frequency information or very little frequency information. If I make this window narrower, 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 then I actually pick out as a part of the signal very nicely where this piece of the signal is in time, but I lose all the frequency content. However, if I make a big window, I got lots of frequency content, but no time localization. So that's the problem with this, with this issue. However, it illustrates two key things. Okay? This is the part that Gabor really pointed out, that in this Gabor piece, there's two key concepts. First, there is this short time window controlled by A. So the parameter A tells me the width of the window. So in some sense, I have a scaling parameter. I can scale my time that I want to pick out. It's going to be an important concept. The second thing that Gabor illustrates is this idea of translation in time. Right? 
parameter tau. So I slide and I can scale. Those are your two options. But with Gabor, at the beginning, you fix A, slide, tau. So right away, this is where the resolution problem comes because you fix a window and you slide it around. Okay. But we don't have to do that. And it's actually not that hard to see that, well, what I could do is instead of doing this, why don't I instead decide to say, I'll slide tau, and why don't I also slide A around? I can do that, right? So for instance, if I come back to this picture, I can say, why don't I first make a window that captures the whole thing? What is my objective in doing that? My objective in making a big window over the whole thing is to pull out low frequency content. Low frequency content exists over that whole time. So I use a big window, pull out low frequencies, and I use smaller and smaller and smaller windows to pull out high frequencies. Right? Simple. Low frequencies are not localized in time. So I can do it with a big window. High frequencies are localized in time, so I can use very small windows. Gabor just does the whole thing with one window. And now what wavelets are going to do is basically take this concept, these two fundamental ideas, and now slide it both in tau and in A. Everybody go with that? Kind of a really trivial extension of or way to think about it. Are you ready? Now we introduce what we call the mother wavelet. Not the mother of all wavelets, just a mother wavelet. Okay? Ready? I don't think there is a mother of all wavelets. Or they'd probably be in a movie somewhere. Okay, so ready for the mother wavelet? Or is it too late in the afternoon to tell jokes? Anybody tired? I'm super tired. That's probably why I tell more than I normally would. Okay, here we go. The mother wavelet, or a, sorry, a mother wavelet. Uh, by the way, the term wavelet comes from the idea of little wave. Like if I was little, you might call me Nathan Lit or something, right? So, but I'm not. I'm huge. <laughs> so you wouldn't. But if you had a little wave, you'd call it a wavelet. And this is the idea. You're going to take little waves, or at first you're going to take a big wave, but then you're going to make it smaller and smaller and smaller, pull out features, and these little pieces of wave, you're going to pull those out with little wavelets. Isn't that cute? It's not so cute when you start doing math on it, but for right now it sounds cute. And here's the idea. We're going to introduce a function called psi a, b, t. It's going to be our mother wavelet. And it's going to kind of have this scaling function here. I'm not going to give you a specific wavelet, wavelet more of a functional relationship between the parameters a and b, where a and b are real, and a is not zero. What do these two parameters do? I'm going to give you some psi. It's going to be a localized function, essentially, this, this psi here. By the way, there's all kinds of wavelets. So we're going to talk about some different wavelets that are out there. But even when we talk about doing wavelet decompositions, it's not like a Fourier transform. There's kind of one Fourier transform. When you do a wavelet transform, you could do a Haar wavelet. You could do a Dobashi's wavelet. You could do uh, a Morale wavelet. There's all kinds of wavelets. Okay? People make up different wavelets for different purposes. So part of your job is if you're going to do wavelets, is you better understand your field well enough to know what people use in your field. There's probably a reason they picked a wavelet in your field. Maybe you work on seismology, and there's a very reason, specific reason you pick out certain wavelets because they have some very nice properties related to seismology. Okay? So when you think about doing generic wavelets, it's not as easy as just saying, oh, I'll just apply a wavelet transform and which wavelet transform. Okay? So we'll come to talk about that a little bit more. The key parameters here are A, scaling, and B, translation. These are the two key things introduced by Gabor. Slide that thing around, but here's the deal. Here's our degree of freedom we're introducing now that Gabor didn't. 
he made this, you know, I pick A to B, it fixed and I do it. Now we're not going to do that. We're going to actually slide A around and use A to pull out frequency and time content across a huge range, okay, and get better time frequency resolution than any of the current methods that we have available. Okay. So let me introduce you to your first wavelet. You guys ready? The mother wavelet of this, what's called, uh, by the way, wavelets are kind of old. The first one was the Haar wavelet, 1910. Okay? So here's the idea. I want to localize in time, for instance. This is what the idea was behind the Haar wavelet. It's like, well, you could expand in Fourier modes, but what do Fourier modes do? When you have a signal, you expand. Let's, let's take a simple signal. Suppose I have a signal here. This is my time domain. Suppose I wanted to do this with Fourier transforms. What do I do when I do it with Fourier transforms? Well, you expand in sines and cosines that live on this huge interval. But the thing is just sitting right there. That seems kind of dumb, right? So why not introduce the basis functions to expand in that are kind of, by construction, localized? Okay, so Haar did this. And what Haar introduced, this is a Haar mother wavelet, is the following. This psi of t mother wavelet looks like this. Exciting. There it is, the Haar wavelet. Okay, but in theory, you could use this wavelet and as the mother wavelet and expand a function in terms of these things instead of sines and cosines. What's nice about it? What's really nice about this has compact support. It's localized. Look at that. It exists between 0 and 1. The fact is I can slide it around, right? I'm going to take this wavelet, slide it, compress it, expand it. So you give me a signal and I can say I'll construct a bunch of these in my Sliding them and contracting and compressing or compress or sorry, what's the opposite of compression? Expansion, yeah, expand, yeah. Anyway, some combination of these things. I'm going to construct a signal out of these kind of functions. Okay, excellent localization in time. Right there, it is. This is the in time. It's localized. Right, so it's just this function where it's. It's 1 or negative 1 or 0. So it's 1 between uh, t between half and 0. And it's and negative 1 between. OK, so that's your mother wavelet. By the way, very important, is what its Fourier transform looks like. Because again, when we introduce a wavelet, by the way, we never actually get away from the ideas of Fourier, Fourier right? Fourier tells us expansion of frequencies. It still, it still has that interpretation, right? So whenever we introduce, let's say, a wavelet, we're always going to have to introduce its, or think about its Fourier transform, even though we're going to expand now in these functions and not in the Fourier basis. Okay, you'll see how the Fourier transform plays a role. Okay, I didn't mean to draw that again. But here is the Fourier transform of this thing. It's like a sync function. Oh. Okay, so if you take a step function, the Fourier transform of a step function is a sync function. Now we basically have two steps, so it's kind of a double type sync function here. The one, by the way, one important thing, this envelope, this k is like 1 over omega. So even though the Haar basis function is it's the first wavelet, it was introduced not in the context of what we're doing here, but it was introduced then as trying to do local, local expansions of, of functions. Uh, the one bad thing about it is it decays very slowly in frequency. So it has great localization here in time, but very bad localization in frequency. 
So ultimately, again, when we go to this idea of looking at our signal in time and frequency, this function would give us very nice time, bad frequency, right? And what we're trying to do is get the best of both, if we can. So what are we going to do with this Haar wavelet? Well, there's lots of things to do with it uh, and some properties we should note about it. So first of all, some of the properties are of this Haar wavelet uh, that are kind of obvious if you integrate over this thing. You get zero. The area under the square of the curve of the absolute value is 1. And it has what we call compact support. So compact support, all that means, right, is that it lives on a finite interval of 0 outside of that. Okay, Any function that goes to 0 outside of some range, we call it has, say, has compact support. Okay. So those are some properties about this thing. And let me uh, tell you what you're going to do with uh, something like this. With a Haar wavelet, you're going to construct signals. And the idea is, now, is with this Haar wavelet basis function, you're going to turn this thing into a function of a v t. a is going to be essentially our scaling. B is our translation. Okay, so for instance, I could do the following with this function. I could take <coughs> the mother wavelet is one or negative one between, so it goes from zero to half is one, half to one is negative one. I could, for instance, translate it over here somewhere by B, and then. I could compress it by saying, hey, how about if I make a is equal to half instead of 1? So in other words, what I'm going to say is the mother wavelet that I just plotted over there is, that means over on that board when I plotted, that's obvious. When I draw an arrow right, it means what I drew on that board over there. Two boards over. <laughs> uh, what I plotted over there was this, 1, 0. a was 1, and it was sitting, started at the origin. So that's the mother wavelet that we start with. So for instance, what if I wanted to plot something like this? Use a as a half, and b is 2. Well, sir, first I'd slide it over 2. That's the translation piece. a as a half is actually going to scale it so that now this thing, this is 1, 2, 3. So now this thing uh, looks like the following. There's my higher wavelet. Now it goes to height 2, negative 2. And, you know, this is 2 and a half right there. So I compressed it. So the area under the curve is still preserved. And I slid it over by 2. Okay? So that is psi 1 half 2 t. Right? So, for instance, Suppose I have the mother wavelet to start with, and I'm looking at a signal, and I want to say, okay, I need to resolve the signal well. And I can start scaling and translating. So for instance, that's my mother wavelet, and let's take something like, here's my signal, there's nothing, and then all of a sudden there's stuff right over here around 5 or something like this. Well, what I'd want to do is, you know, first of all, probably use like v equals 5, get my Haar wavelets over here, and then start scaling it so it's around the width of this thing and keep adding more and more of them, higher and higher resolution, so that I actually can, with very few of these Haar wavelets, define that signal. Does that make sense to everybody? It's just another way to do it. Right? This is no different than Fourier. It's just it's a, a little different looking basis, set of basis functions, essentially. Okay? All right. So this is just like the idea of Gabor in some sense, because essentially you're, you're using a window, but you're sort of using a dynamic scaling window. You just go look for the signal over here, and then you 
Gabor says A is fixed, but you say, well, no, I don't have to have A is fixed. So just kind of keep resolving it finer and finer using uh, more and more refined scalings. And then I can actually get this thing out pretty quickly with very few wavelets, right? I mean, part of the thing you want to do computationally is use as few wavelets as you have to, right? You want to take a signal and you want to represent that signal with as few wavelets or Fourier modes as you can, right? That's, that's the idea of extracting a good signal, okay? All right. So this is kind of the idea. By the way, what happens to the Fourier domain of things like this? Okay, so I get good localization of time, but when I compress the signal, the spectrum doubles its width. Okay, so it has bad localization in frequency. Okay. All right. Everybody okay with that? The Haar wavelet? Does that kind of uh, make some intuitive sense, hopefully a little bit? Hopefully it does. So, this is the concept then. Signal. And what I want to do, I give you a mother wavelet. The mother wavelet can go two ways, and this is important. I can scale it fatter, I can scale it thinner. Whatever I want to do with it, right? I have A and B to work with. And initially, I have, call it psi 1, 0 is the mother. It's sitting in the center of my domain. And all I'm going to do is say, OK, first thing I want to do is, why don't I make a wave that just goes across that whole domain, my whole time signal? So I want to take this scale and pick A so that I get a wavelet that compromises the whole domain. Why am I doing that? I'm just getting the low frequency content. Okay? Once I get it, I'm done. I don't worry about, well, essentially, in some sense, I pick it out. Okay, I know what the low frequency content is. Now I'll scale it so that I do half the domain. So I can just change this A, cut it in half, look at this half of the domain, pull out the frequency content there. Right? Cut it in half again, pull out the frequency content there. If I were to take this window, of course I'm losing all kinds of frequencies, but I already, I already got those frequencies by doing the bigger scale, right? Do the big scale, cut it in half, get the next intermediate long scales, get the finer scale. You keep resolving higher and higher and higher. Does that make sense to everybody? You just multi, it's called multi-resolution, okay? We'll talk a lot more about that on Monday. But you just keep cutting it in half, there's your window, there's your window, you keep shrinking it down. Every time you shrink it, you get really nice time localization properties. You lose frequency content, but you already picked it up. That was your first step. Big wavelet, you got the frequency content on the big scale, and you keep shrinking. That is the algorithm of the wavelet. Okay? All right. In fact, I think it's, it's time. It's time for a picture. Everybody, every, everybody ready for a picture? Me too. Okay, ready? Let's draw a picture. When you don't know what to say next, you just draw pictures. Right, I actually kind of think I know what I'm going to say next, but I'm going to draw you a picture instead. Here we go. Boxes. You've already seen some of this this morning. But this cartoon, like I said, you have to get this cartoon in your head. If you don't understand this cartoon, you don't understand wavelets. You don't understand time frequency analysis. This cartoon is critical. Understand this cartoon. That's what I'm telling you to do, I guess. Four boxes. Let's start off with the idea of time series analysis. What you do in time series analysis, you don't look at any spectral information. You just look at the time series. And you chop it up time very finely. You know exactly what happens at every instant of time where the signal is. So you have a lot of information at every single point in time. No frequency information. OK? Picture looks like this. Remember this picture? Like I said, this is where it helps Like if I had the lecture Wednesday, because now it would be two days later, and you would have forgotten I drew that picture. But since I drew it this morning, you're like, he already did that. But you, just, but you have to pretend like it was two days ago. 
Okay, so there it is. Everybody good with that? Time frequency analysis. All right, what about the Fourier transform? Fourier transform method. Fourier transform, you take the whole time signal and you throw it into the frequency domain. You, you have no more time information. Everything's just frequency content. And this is a great thing to do if you have a stationary signal, but you don't. So you have all this frequency content, and you have no idea when in the signal there was this, for instance, this nice little high frequency ringing, right? You, you lose track of any of that information, but you really have great resolution in the frequency. And you have no idea about where it is in time. Okay? So this is, again, that picture that we drew this morning. Then there was the idea of Gabor, which is I'm going to split it. I'm going to do a little time window, slide it across. And when I do the sliding across my data, whatever my window width is, that gives me time resolution. And for every time window I have, I have a certain frequency resolution. So here, you're kind of saying, I'll trade some of my time information for frequency and some of my frequency for time. And you get patches, in which you can say, at this time, how much frequency content do I have localized around this spot? You can actually calculate this. Okay? <coughs> Granted, you throw away some information in this, right? Because whatever your window size, you chop off or you filter perhaps all the low frequencies and things like this. Okay? And how much information you lose depends a lot on how you pick your filtering in time to do this. Here's the wavelet picture. What I'm first going to do in the wavelet picture is an algorithm. I'm going to start off saying, hey, spectral transform the whole dang thing. FFT it, essentially, to some extent, right? I'm just going to take the whole time signal and look at its Fourier components. So I don't have any spectral resolution. But now what I'm going to do, I'm going to do the experiment over again. And now I'm going to take my mother wavelet and I'm going to scale it be half the size or some fraction of the box, and then I'm going to slide it around. And so here's the canonical picture representing this process. There it is. You start off here, great frequency resolution. You have no idea where these frequencies live, but you have all the frequency. You took the whole signal, you, Fourier you, know, you put it in the frequency domain and say, I know every single frequency piece of this signal. I have no idea where it is in time, but I have it all. Then I say, OK, let's scale. Let's use this A parameter that I have to do the scaling of the wavelets. Now let's cut this, let's say, for instance, in half. Sample, two boxes, half the size. Well, now I get some information, right? I, I, I actually get some time information. Oh, is it in the front half or the back half of the signal? Well, I can get that. OK. You get, some, and you get less frequency information. OK, so you're starting to chop up frequency. Then you say, OK, let's sample it again with half the size. Now I get more time resolution, less frequency. And again, then I keep chopping up in time, less frequency. But I already have a lot of frequency from here. Right? It's not like I threw this away. I know all this already, so I'm just improving my time frequency resolution by doing this. So when I come up here on the scaling, I have great time res resolution, <coughs> very bad frequency resolution. But that's OK. I already got the good frequency resolution. Does everybody understand that? Is that, is that good? So you're just going level by level and pulling away frequency content. You take the same signal, and you say, all right, let me pull out the low frequencies. Next step. My filter that I'm applying, my wavelet mother, my mother wavelet. There's no difference, right? <laughs> my wavelet mother, you go there, and now you've lost a bunch of frequency information, but you already had it. So you don't need it. Now you pull out what's there. Go one level down. Keep going one level down. When do you stop? Whenever you want. Right? This is a process that ultimately you control. How much resolution do you need in time? How much resolution do you need in frequency? That's when you stop. OK? 
Okay? So when you, when you actually do this um, in a discrete fashion, in a compute, com computational fashion, you get to decide how many levels do I want to go down. Okay? And every level I go down, I get finer and finer time scale resolution, higher frequency content at the expense of throwing away all my low frequencies. But I already had them anyway. Okay? All right, so that is the picture. You take the same signal and you just keep processing that same signal over and over again by using the scaling and translation. It's the whole process of wavelets. Questions on that? Is that that cartoon? That's 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 the key. The rest is all math, right? But it, it, it's hard to understand what you're going to try to do mathematically if you don't understand that picture. Okay. So contemplate that over the weekend. I would suggest a nice uh, pose, relaxed, uh, legs crossed. I, I'm very uncomfortable that way, so I've contemplated for like two seconds. But some of you are really comfortable in a you know pose like that, and you could just think about it for a while, like picture it in your head, draw it over, and maybe in the sand. If you have some sand at your house. Draw it in the sand. What do you think, Edwin? Is that relaxing? relaxing? <laughs> no. Okay. Edwin does not think it's relaxing. But Edwin also doesn't like Seattle, so what can we say about Edwin? Maybe not a whole lot. <laughs> All right. Everybody good so far? So now we're going to talk about the mathematics of this. What is the machinery that actually gets you the information in these cells? Okay. Frequency content along these cells. So we're going to introduce the continuous wave, uh, continuous wavelet transform. Okay, it's like any other transform. It's you apply a kernel, transform it, take your data, and put it in another domain. No different, no different than a Fourier transform. Okay. The nice thing about the Fourier transform is we have a very specific understanding of uh, you know, what, this, what it means in this other domain, right? We're taking something in time and translating it to frequency, okay? So at least in that case, we know what that transform does sort of intuitively. But really, in the end, you're just asking about let's just take some transform, some function. And generically, you know, here's what the transform looks like. Transform some signal with this kernel here. And if you'll notice, Fourier transform had a very simple kernel of e to the i. The Gabor transform had e to the i plus some time filter. And there's all kinds of filters you could put in there. And we're just going to do something a little bit differently. All we're going to do now is put in mother wavelets as our transform kernel. Okay. So here's the deal. Let me introduce um, a couple things first. There's first going to be a concept about admissibility. Okay? When can I actually do a wavelet transform? Can I just make up any mother wavelet and do this? No. There's a couple conditions that have to hold. First, let me define the following. Let's take a wavelet and Again, take the mother wavelet, Fourier transform it. Okay, what's that going to be? Take the mother wavelet. This thing has a Fourier transform that looks like the following. Let me write it in this form here. You can write it all out, but you can always rescale it to something like this. So this is the Fourier transform of the mother wavelet. Why is this, why is this important? Because we're going to define a constant C. Here's what's important. Some constant C that depends upon the mother wavelet you pick, which is defined as the integral from negative infinity to infinity and if you take the Fourier transform of your mother wavelet, absolute value squared divided by the frequency absolute value and integrate over all frequencies. This thing has to be bounded. So you have finite value, value. Okay, this is very important for basically not having things blow up. Okay, you have to be able to integrate this stuff, and this is a condition. So 
admissibility is this condition right here. So whenever I define a wavelet, or if you make up a wavelet, that condition has to be satisfied. Once that's satisfied, then the definition of the continuous Fourier trans wavelet transform holds. I like that one. I don't want to erase that yet. OK, uh, so let's go and define the continuous wavelet transform, often called the CWT for obvious reasons. Um, <coughs> And here it is. It's just simply something very simple. The wavelet transform of some function f, which is a function of a and b. There's the important thing. It's now a function of a and b. So I, I can understand how this function behaves as a function of my scaling and translation. Is equal, it's just an inner product with f times the mother wavelet. There it is. Simple. The mother wavelet plays the role of the kernel. That's it. Okay? That is the definition of a wavelet transform. Again, I leave it in this form here. The thing to keep in mind, remember, is that there's lots and lots of different types of wavelets. So we leave it generically like this. The Haar wavelet, this integral is really easy to do, right? Because the Haar wavelet is 1, minus 1, 0 everywhere else. So, you know, for instance, it's kind of nice, right? Computationally, it's very nice. Um, OK. So it's like a Fourier transform, except just, you just have a different kernel. All right. Well, by the way, let's check out the Haar wavelet. Yeah, we can do the Haar wavelet. OK. The Haar wavelet we define. So let's go to that case. If you look at the Haar wavelets for a transform, it's it's a sync function, like I promised. Okay. Uh, well, something like a sync. It's actually it has a sine squared up top, not a sine. But this is the Fourier transform of it. So what we want to ask is the following. Is the Haar wavelet an admissible class of wavelets? Right? There's only one condition I've stated making this an admissible class. And the admissible class says that what I've got to do is integrate this thing here, its absolute value, squared over omega, p omega. And I've got to show that that's less than infinity. And it turns out you can calculate it for this wavelet. And you get 16, 1 over omega cubed sine absolute value of omega over 4 to the fourth d, d omega. And this is, in fact, less than infinity. Why? This is bounded between 1 and minus 1. The kernel dies like 1 over you know, omega cubed. right? The, the, the problematic case would be 1 over omega. right? Do you remember doing in calculus the whole, if I have a paint can that goes like 1 over omega, can I paint the outside? Or uh, how does it go? Does it take an infinite amount of paint to paint the outside or, or an infinite amount of paint to fill it? In one case, there's a finite amount of paint, maybe to paint an <laughs> infinite amount of paint to fill it. I can't remember what it was. Does anybody remember? Yeah. So you can fill it, this can that goes like 1 over omega, with a finite amount of paint. But if you try to paint it, you have an infinite amount of paint. Crazy. So don't try to paint cans like that. All right. So that's the kind of thing. It's the 1 over omega case. But this goes like 1 over omega cubed. It's clearly going to be bounded, finite. This is, in fact, an admissible class. So that's the kind of games you play with things like this. Other cool things. This, this is one of the more remarkable properties, I have to say. <coughs> and this is, it's partly because of this property that people get carried away. Okay? This is why we have so many different wavelets to some extent. Suppose I have a wavelet. A tried and true wavelet. Just like uh, something I defined there, it satisfies admissibility. Now, let's just consider another function phi, or psi. Phi. <laughs> phi, that one. 
phi, right? Consider phi. And suppose this phi of t is just uh, bounded, integrable function. Okay? Then the convolution of psi and phi is another wavelet. Now, of course, you could say, wow, that means I have a lot of potential for creating wavelets. In fact, you do. Right? I mean, I could just start with the har. I could take any integral function and just keep making any, many, as many wavelets as I want. Right? And people have done this. They've played around. And what, what are you trying to do in doing that? You're trying to get the best time and frequency resolution jointly that you possibly can. Okay? I'm going to show you some wavelets on Monday that when you look at them, go like, that makes no sense at all. Like, it's completely non-intuitive, but they have great properties, okay? And you construct these things in kind of crazy ways. The Dobashi wavelets, if you've ever seen these things, they're like, that doesn't even make sense. It's like this crazy looking function, <coughs> but who cares what it looks like? In the end, you're just going to use a piece of software to create it expand your basis in there and go on, right? And the pro it's, it's more important what the properties of localization and time and space are, okay? I have some examples in the notes of how to construct some other ones. But we've got things to do. We've got other things to move on to. All right, so we'll keep moving on. Ro, how are you doing back there? Yeah, you ready for the weekend? Who's got the best plans for the weekend yet? See, it's Friday at 4.30. We can take a minute to talk about this. Okay, who is going clubbing tonight? Everybody. People at home, I hope you have better plans than this. Sad. Come on. Nobody who at least might go to the bar for a drink. One, two, three. Three. There should really be more of you. Dang. Okay. Exactly. Who's going to hug the pillow and we swap violently? We violently into the night. <laughs> All right, all right, great. I'll stop making fun, maybe. That's, uh, thanks, Will. That was a good one. I should have been more courageous with that. With that said, you ready? Uh, here we go. This is just getting ready for the party. What do you think the first word? Complete the sentence. Hat, wavelet, party. Anybody guessing? Come on, I heard it. Maybe? Me Mexi Mexican hat party. I mean, Mexican hat wavelet. OK? OK. All right, you guys are not on with me yet. Mexican hat wavelets. Uh, here's what they look like. It's like they're pretty important, uh, especially in seismology. This guy Morley kind of played around with these things. It turns out they have really great resolution properties for multiple scales for these seismology problems. And essentially, how they're defined, psi of t is equal to 1 minus t squared. And if I were to plot that, da -da 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 no? OK, nobody's on there? Mexican hat wavelet. All right. Edwin, Matt, no? You guys should go to the bar. These are my students, and they, my homework to you is you go to the bar. Give me a report by Saturday morning. <laughs> Not early, though, because I know you didn't go then. OK. There is the Mexican hat wavelet. Localized beautifully. It has some width. And we're just going to translate it and use the width to you know, basically define everything on this thing. By the way, so this is psi. <coughs> it's for a transform, psi hat omega. Go to 2 pi, omega squared, e to the minus omega squared over 2. For a transform is a double bump thing looking like this. Okay, so what I could do with this is basically say, look, I know how to construct this thing, and I know how to change its width and its center position. Right? Change the center position, you just change t to t minus b. 
change its width by just putting a scaling parameter under the Gaussian, an A. So I can make these thinner, fatter, whatever I want to do with them. Great localization. It satisfies all the properties of the wavelet. And this thing here then becomes a really nice wavelet basis. And by the way, if I have any integral function, I can just convolute it with it and get another wavelet. Right? So this is one of the more famous of the wavelets. Okay, this is quite old, and so I just want you to be educated about Mexican hat parties that you're all going to go to after this, right? Okay. All right. All right. Uh, I don't think you guys are getting prepared for the final yet, because the final is going to be on the Friday, last day of class. We're going to go out to the big time. We're not big time. We're going to call it in. We're going to get the back room there. We all just have a final, which means we're all there. And we, the final is just to, you know, have fun with me, with each other. Okay. Put that on your calendar. Start getting prepared for it now, because you guys look like you need some help with that. All right. Now, here's what's important about these wavelets. Time, frequency, localization. You can calculate time, frequency, localization. So, sigma t. We did this, by the way, for the Gabor. For the Gabor, we said, if I have a wavelet window, how localized in time and space is it? Same thing here. All this is, is you calculate the second moment around some mean. So you say, I look around some mean time t, t bracket. I want to go look there and see how much energy is localized around that spot. And here it is. <coughs> I want to look at how much energy is around some frequency. There it is. These are important quantities because it tells you how widely spread stuff is in time and frequency. And these relationships are close also to calculating the energy in each one of these cells. How much energy is at some time frequency component? Well, you can do a little integral around that point, too. OK. Um, those are some good properties to know. Another property to know is how to invert it, right? That's kind of always important. You get this. Here's how you get the wavelet transform of a function. To get it back, to invert this thing, to get back to f of t. This is why you need that c coefficient to be bounded, okay? Because the inversion formula has it in it, 1 over c. So you want this thing to be finite, not zero, obviously. It's not going to be zero. And you do a double integral from negative infinity to infinity of, you take this wavelet transform here of A and B, and you just multiply it by dB, dB, d a over a squared. There it is. It's just, this, is, this is the inversion formula. You integrate over all of your translations, all of your scalings, pull out your sigma, reconstruct it. Okay? There's the process. Wavelet transform, inverse wavelet transform. And uh, there's a discrete version of this. Ultimately, what you're going to work on is a lattice. You're going to break up your domain to a frequency components and time components. And once you've broken it up into this, part of there's this, always this picture that they basically paint for you. Paint, draw, whatever you want to do. It. You paint or, you know, nobody paints a picture in a book anymore. They plot it. There, that's what I was looking for. Plotting a picture. They plot this foot picture. Here are, uh, let me see, how many do I want? Five, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. These are the B values. How you slide things. Left, right. And you do it in discrete fashion. So for instance, on your first pass, you would slide your window at every one of these points. Why? Because here on this scale, I'm plotting the log base 2 of A. So if A is 1, you're here. The whole window. 
And now I'm going to get better resolution. Or, uh, so, sorry. Now, so if, if I go up this way, I'm making fatter and fatter wavelets. Okay? So here, now, because I got a fatter wavelet, I only need to do every other point to cover that range. Does that make sense? I go up one more level. I've doubled my fatness of the wavelet again. Covers more space. So then I only need to sample these. So there's this hierarchical way of thinking, right? You do a big sampling, you cut it, you more points, more points. This, this is the same idea. This plot, in some sense, which you will see a lot in wavelet books. I want you just, I'm doing it just for kind of completeness. This plot here <coughs> is, in some sense, Just the take on that plot right there. Big domain, cut in half, but what I did is I drew it from this side up. So I, I turned it upside down. But that's typically what most people draw it that way. So I just want you to, if you see that in a book, you won't get all confused. You'll just say, oh, that's that in disguise. Okay? All right, with that, we will end. I do hope uh, you have an exciting weekend. Better than uh, you're looking like you might have right now. <laughs> Because right now it looks like you might have a pathetic weekend. But there's always hope that maybe in an hour you'll be feeling better. Maybe you'll have a Chipotle's burrito and life will look so rosy after that. One can only hope. Have a good weekend, guys.